Hello, Austin. My name is Tina Roth Eisenberg, as Sean just told you, but you mostly probably know me as Swiss Swiss, which is my Twitter handle and the name of my popular design blog. I believe in side projects and eccentric ants, and I will explain all about that. But first of all, my daughter asked me to show this to you guys. Um, when I was working on my talk, uh, she asked me, Mom, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, gonna, I'm invited to, to a big conference, and I'm going to give a talk in front of a really large audience. And she said, why? And I said, well, mommy's work is a little unusual, and they want to hear about it. And then she looked at me, and she goes, mommy, are you going to tell them how much you love what you do? And I tell you, as a parent, I just hugged her and thought, that is complete parental win right there. Like, if a kid realizes how much you love your job, there's nothing better you can convey to a, uh, to a child. And I'm extremely fortunate for what I do, um, because I love going to work, and, and I realize that I'm, I'm truly blessed. And if you don't know what I do, I want to give you a quick summary. I run, as I mentioned, a design blog called Swiss Miss. I run a co-working space called Studio Mates in Dumbo. I run a lecture series called Creative Mornings. I run a to-do app called Tudu. And I run a temporary tattoo shop called Tatly. And I'm also a mother of two. And my clicker doesn't work. There we go. That's my wonderful husband, Gary, who's now uh, watching the kids and making this possible that I can be here. That's my six-year-old, Ella, flying, and that's my three-year-old son. And that's not how we usually walk around in, uh, in Brooklyn. But who here has kids? So I'm sure you all agree with me that there's no other moment in life where you really think about who you are and how you became who you are and why you are where you are and what your dreams are than the moment you hold that kid in your arm. And that's exactly what happened with me. When I became pregnant with my daughter, my first child, I really started looking back at where I am in life and where I'm in my career. And I realized that there were a few dreams that I had never really um, acted upon, for example, running a design studio. And I was asking myself, why? I was always waiting for that perfect moment, but the perfect moment is actually never here. So I took the bold move and said, when my daughter is born, I'm going to finally start my own design studio. And at the same time, I did sort of the opposite. When, my son, when I got pregnant with my son, and again, the more pregnant I got, the more I started thinking about where I am in my life. And I said, you know what, actually, I'm, I don't want to solve other people's problems anymore. I kind of want to solve my own problems. And um, thanks to the income from my blog, was able to take a one-year client sabbatical, and also with the support of my husband. And this one-year client sabbatical was three years ago, and it has been extended indefinitely. So in some sense, my kids have been my biggest career catalysts, because they made me really look at where I am in life and where I want to be, and I acted accordingly. But I wonder in moments like this, when my son has like one of these super epic silent meltdowns, and I'm sure I was exactly the same, I wonder, like, how did I come from this stage to being here today and having a truly fulfilled life and absolutely loving what I do. And how did I get here and what, what decisions have I made? Because I realized in the end of the day, um, life is nothing but a sum of total choices. And what I want to do is help my kids uh, make equally good decisions that they get to a place where I am, uh, a, a truly blessed place. And by the way, I'm documenting these meltdowns and um, <laughs> It's heartbeing2.tumblr.com. <laughs> so I want to give you just a little bit of a background on where I'm from. I grew up on the Swiss countryside. And this is sort of like what it would look like out of my bedroom window. And I grew up with a lot of fresh air. And I grew up in a town that has literally, it's called Speicher, less inhabitants that are currently in this room. So when I told my parents that I'm going to be speaking in a room that has more people in it than there are in our town, and told my, my daughter she couldn't really fathom that. So if you don't mind, this is like a little segue here, like a little like detour. If you don't mind, would you mind that we do a, a, a wave, and I film it, and then I'll send it to my parents? Because this is kind of epic. OK. 
OK, when I say one, two, three, go, when I point at this section, you guys start, OK? And then where I'm pointing with the hand, that's where the wave is going, OK? Cool? OK, this is for my family and for my daughter, guys, OK? Give your best. Make the Swiss proud. OK, one, two, three, go. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Anyhow, so thank you, guys. Um, so when you grow up in Switzerland, you grow up with a lot of fresh air, and sort of you're surrounded with an understanding that design and art is important. And there's not a, no better example that when you look at our the Swiss banknotes, the Swiss actually dedicated their banknotes to artists, designers, historians, and writers which is truly amazing. So I was raised, I was a really creative kid, and I was raised with the understanding that design is important because you're in Switzerland. But at the same time, this is also a typical thing you would see in the Swiss countryside in front of homes. The Swiss are just unbelievably detailed, and everything is very orderly. This is a typical wood stack you would see outside a Swiss's house, a Swiss person's house. So this orderliness can get a little, I felt sometimes was a little limiting. But luckily, I had this super crazy eccentric aunt called Hookie, who has really been the catalyst in my, in, for my inspiration growing up. She was a fashion uh, designer by trade, and obviously not your typical Swiss aunt. Um, she lived an incredibly courageous, creative life. Her home was this beautifully curated place with art and quirky things and beautiful uh, design bra objects. And she's always been my inspiration, and also, she did this crazy thing every year for Carnival, where she uh, made these crazy costumes for her entire Guke music. It's like a Carnival band. It's, some people call it organized noise. And that's her with the bass, with that big bass drum. If that's not enough for a young girl to blow your mind and, and consider your aunt completely cool, there was also this. Her partner at, time, at the time, when I was about seven, I was at their house, and I watched him draw a type. Clearly, this was before computers. And I sat there and was super fascinated. And I said, Hans Uli, what are you doing? And he said, I'm working. I said, what do you mean you're working? He says, I'm being paid. I'm doing a client assignment. He was a graphic designer. And that moment blew my mind. I could make a living being a graphic designer. I could make a living drawing type. And that's what I pursued for the rest of my Youth, I, I, I always knew I want to become a graphic designer, and that's what I studied. I went to first business school and language school and then art school. And when I was 26 in 1999, I graduated from graphic design school in, in Munich. And I convinced my parents that they would allow me the dream of going to New York for three months. And in 1999, in September, I flew to New York. I got in on Monday night, and on Tuesday morning, I had one interview lined up in a small design studio. I went in there, and Matthew Waltman, who now runs Nuka, who at the time ran the design studio, he sat me down, he talked to me, and not, not a mere five minute into our conversation, he went, first, Tina, you're never going back to Switzerland. And I thought, that's a cocky thing to say. And two, sit down, you got yourself an internship. So I literally arrived, I got myself a, a, an internship, which turned into a visa and a design job and I found myself a new home. It's been over 13 years that I live in New York now, and I've, I've realized that in New York, everyone talks as fast as me, walks as fast as me, and is equally bubbling over with enthusiasm and ideas, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't think of a happier place for myself. But most of all, what was really liberating for me, for someone who came from a small town, a small village on the countryside was, I felt incredibly liberated that I could live by my own standards and set my own rules and set my own values. And that's what I've done for the last 13 years, and especially becoming a parent, I, was, I wanted to articulate them even more because now I want to pass them on to my children. So what I want to share with you is my 11 rules I live by. And when I mean I live by, I mean that both professionally and personally. The first one is actually a quote from Jessica Jackley in a talk she gave two weeks ago. Invest your life in what you love. I was extremely fortunate to figure out early on what I, want, I needed to inherently do and become a, 
a graphic designer, a creative person. And I understand that a lot of people don't find that so early on in their life. But what I urge everyone always to never stop looking. And the perfect example is my brother-in-law, and I have the utmost respect for him. Because when you look at his path, his professional path, he just kept searching, even though if the road got really bumpy and he was really uncomfortable, he became an architect through the apprenticeship uh, system uh, in Switzerland, which means like you go to school at night and you work, it's really hard. And then he became a business engineer. Again, he went to school at night. And then with 31, he moved back in with his parents and decided to become a lawyer. And he went to the most prestigious uh, law school, the university in St. Gallen, and studied for four and a half years, became a lawyer, did the law degree, got an amazing job in a law firm, and was instantly on the, on the partner track to then, just a few months in, realizing I, this doesn't make me happy. He came home and he talked to my sister, who's an amazing woman, and she said, you know what? Then stop, don't do it if it doesn't make you happy. So at this point, he's like, what, 37? And he started over, and because he was an architect and because he was a lawyer, he like super, uber qualified to be now, in, has now the most amazing job. He now heads the entire real estate portfolio for Zurich Insur Insurance in Switzerland and is the happiest person. And I find his story so inspiring that he was willing to go back and live with his parents and just keep on searching and being honest with himself and saying, yes, I'm on a really comfy partner track, but I don't want to do this. And the, this brings me to a beautiful quote by L. P. Jack. A master in the art of living draws no sharp distinction between his work and his play, his labor and his leisure, his mind and his body, his education and his recreation. He hardly knows which is which. He simply pursues his vision of excellence through whatever he is doing and leaves others to determine whether he's working or playing. To himself, he always appears to be doing both. And that's pretty much how I feel about what I do. I really don't distinguish much between my personal life and my, and my work and my play. It all is a blur. And I came across this Venn diagram by Bud Cadell a week ago, where uh, he, I think he titled it, uh, How to Find Happiness in Business. And it's basically the intersections of what we do well, what we can do to be paid, and what we want to do. And when all of those three things intersect, you have that super crazy hooray uh, area. And I'm, I'm lucky enough to live in that hooray space. And I feel like there's nothing more refreshing to, to, to be around people that are thoroughly, thoroughly passionate about what they do. And this brings me to my second rule. Embrace enthusiasm. People that work with me or know me know that I have, a, a, at times, a crazy, unstoppable enthusiasm. It's like a childlike enthusiasm, and I'm not afraid to show it. And I just happened to have this little video that I took last Sunday when my dear friend John Ford, who also happens to be the developer of my site, Swissmas, sent me a text message. He completely surprised me. He said, the text message basically said, Tina, check out your site, resize the browser window, you're a keynote speaker, your site needs to be responsive. So he secretly made my site responsive. And I was, as I got this text me message, I was in my studio, and my son was napping in the back. And I had to send him a video of me dan dancing through the studio and just show him my sheer excitement for what he's just done for me. And people that work with me know that this is a, a scene often um, experienced in our, in our studio. And I feel like the enthusiasm is a crucial component for us to, uh, that leads the way when the road gets bumpy. If you're enthusiastic about some, something, it doesn't matter. You keep going. And also, it gets me in the flow. If I'm really into something, it get, gets me into the flow, and I forget time, and I feel like I'm sort of, of I'm part of something larger. And I'm absolutely not afraid. If I, I sh I sh if I should ever be known for something, I would love to be known as she was really enthusiastic. And she was not afraid to show it. Because after all, no one looks stupid when they're having fun. And it brings me to the next value that I have. Don't complain makes things better. This is a big one in my book. And actually, I have a good story around that. My last business venture, Tatley, actually came out of this personal rule. So in May of 2011, my daughter came home from a birthday party, and she was going through her goodie bag, and she pulled out these extremely hideous, ugly, badly designed um, temporary tattoos, a complete insult to my Swiss aesthetics. And <laughs> she asked me to apply them on her skin, and as I did, 
I found myself complaining. And I have this personal rule that if I find myself complaining about something, I have to either do something about it or let it go. So as the tattoo was drying, I came to the conclusion there was only one thing I could do, and that it was do something about it. So I started researching what it takes to, do, uh, to manufacture temporary tattoos. I reached out to about 12 of my friends and designers and illustrators and sort of just bounced off the idea saying, hey, what would you say if I made a cool site where we sell temporary tattoos for kids and grown-ups and, you know, by designers? And little did I know that for designers, it's extremely enticing to design for skin. I, it didn't occur to me. But the ne very next day, my inbox was flooded with ideas. So fast forward two months, we launched our store on Shopify. I blogged about it on Swissmas, and we literally stood next to the printer like two minutes later, and orders kept going in, kept coming in. And this was our, our first marketing photo with like the mere 16 designs we had. And actually, that's Mark Kevin who's sitting right there. That, those are his arms. Um, and then a year later, for our first birthday, we tried to take an everything photo again, but we had so many, we could barely fit it on three people's arms. So <clears throat> the nice story about Tatley, and this is the thing that, that makes me smile every time I think about it. The second day we were in business, we got a call from a very prestigious museum store in London. And the person asked me, can we please have a wholesale catalog? And I said, sure, get me, give, me your, give me your address, please. And I hung up, and I looked around. I looked at my studio mates and said, what, what, what is a wholesale catalog? So we, it never occurred to us that actually stores might want to carry our product. So that day, we made a wholesale catalog. We started working on the packaging. We now have like it's single packagings. We have them as sets. And a few months later, we moved out of Studio Mates, my co-working space, and got our own proper space down the hall. And we've been breaking down walls since we have now three spaces all together. Tatley has now, is now in over 400 stores around the world. We've shipped to over 90 countries. Some of them I can't even pronounce, to be honest. Um, we have over 60 artists that to contribute to the, to the site. Uh, we have famous people order. So we have this secret Excel spreadsheet when famous people order gets us very excited. <laughs> Um, all in all, I would say Tatley is a prime example of that we should all take our side projects seriously and that you never know what's going to happen. And we should never, ever shy away of challenging a status quo, and in this case, uh, the world of temporary tattoos. And this brings me to my most favorite quote ever. And it's by L uh, James Murphy of LCD Sound System. The best way to complain is to make things. But the story of Tatley and all the other things I do is not just a story about me and what I've done. Actually, no, not at all. It's a story of my team. And I want to introduce you to the incredibly smart people that work for me and that taught me lesson number four. You got to trust and you got to empower because everything gets so much better once you do. So in order of how I hired them, I, wanna, I want you to meet my Swiss Army, as I lovingly call them, Swiss Miss, Swiss Army. Um, so this is Rusty, he's mission control at Tatley. This is Yoko, she's the head of design at Tatley. This is Kevin, who sits right there in row four. He's the chief breakfast officer of Creative Mornings. This is Becca, she's the production overlord at Tatley. This is Jen, who's our in-house illustrator and my personal assistant, God bless her. Uh, this is Julia, our photographer. This is Sarah, our global relations. And then Natalie, who's our chief coffee brewer, Tatley studio manager, and shipper extraordinaire. And then missing on photo day was Carly, who's the chief content officer uh, for Creative Mornings. And now check this out. <laughs> so I am, I am incredibly lucky to have such an amazing team work for me. They are smart, they are driven, they are self-reliant, they are fun, and they are not afraid to work. But most of all, what I've realized is that as a, as a designer starting my own company, we, I'm used to being the maker, right? And the shift from being a maker to a manager is hard. And I see that struggle with a lot of startups where the designer is a CEO, and he still wants to meddle with everything. And I think I've gotten better over the last two years to really start letting go. And the, the moment I started letting go and really give everyone their own sort of domain that they own, everything got so much better. 
And a lot of people ask me, like, how are you able to hire such an amazing group of talented folks? Obviously, I cannot compete with like well-funded startups um, or big corporations. And while I have some ideas why that might be the case, I figured I might as well just ask them myself. So here's a few things that my team said. Starting out with Kevin, who started working with me right after college and turned down a Google, Google job offer. He said, when I met you and your studio mates, learned about your work, I found it interesting, humbling, and inspiring. I didn't see the same environment elsewhere. I decided to be an idiot if I didn't take advantage of the opportunity to be in the trenches with you all. There's Becca. I knew I would have, have the opportunity to meet a lot of interesting people when first moving to a new city. There's Rusty. I was most interested in working with you because you were and remain so enthusiastic about making something great. There's Jen. Working for Tina means being part of a community that makes things happen. There's Natalie. Tatley isn't just a job to me, it's my community. And then Yoko. I'm lucky to be working among thoughtful, thoughtful smart, fun people who sincerely love to make things that are amazing. And Sarah, I'm sorry. I wanted to work for a company that valued good design. Me too. Um, so the thing that impresses me about this group of the most is that they are willing to take a risk. They are willing to put experiences uh, over making money. They are, they just put having a purpose and wanting to make a dent into the world over having like a stability and, and, and making a lot of money. I think inherently they know, and I know they're all so good, that money will come later. And I respect them for having, knowing this decision early on, that how they uh, value money. <clears throat> Do you want to see them dance again? Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, if you want to see who they are, you can go to the SwissArmy.com. They made a little mini site, so you can click to their, uh, to their um, Twitter handles and all that. So as I said, they know what mo role money plays, and they're not putting it first. And that is bringing me to the next rule. To me, it's always been that way. Experience, I've always uh, put before money. They've always been more important to me. And a lot of very businessy, typey people oftentimes shrug their head and look at me and don't really understand the decisions I'm making, and that's okay with me. Um, for example, I'm not charging for Creative Mornings, the lecture series, even though we're super, super successful. We probably could charge, but I. That goes against what I wanted it to be. Or we gave to do for free, uh, gave it away for free. Also, people didn't understand that. But what I always say is like that money is not my driving force. I always care so much about what I make, and I always just care about making the best product and it being authentic that eventually I just get this head nod from the universe and money comes on its own. And I believe that when things fall into place, this universe telling me to keep going. And for example, when I needed to rent a desk and move out of home because I couldn't work at home anymore with a nanny and a kid around, just that day I was looking at desk spaces. Jim Kudal emailed me and asked me if I want to be part of the deck network for my site. And the money he offered me was exactly what I needed for a desk. Or Creative Mornings, uh, Craig Shapiro from the Collaborative Fund approached me, introduced himself, and kept taking me out for lunch and kept telling me, Tina, you need to grow this. What you're building here is so valuable for the creative industry. And eventually, he just won me over because he just kept saying all the right things, and he's a wonderful person. And he gave us a little teeny tiny seed investment that, that allowed me to actually hire Kevin. So money, I've, I've never been focusing on it, but it always came on, my, on its own. And trust me, I'm not a trust fund baby. I just make it work. And I truly believe what Scott Belsky said, a labor of love always pays off. To me, what, for example, I've gotten out of Creative Mornings, even though I've never paid myself up, up until now, um, is that the connections I've made, the experiences I've had, and the feeling that I've put a, a dent into the creative community is so incredibly satisfying for me. And it's, so, it's, so much, it's worth so much more than having a big, fat savings account in my book. And, and that's what I believe in. Value number six, uh, surround yourself with like-minded people. So I truly, I, while I love the internet and while I love Twitter and I'm all, I consider it my home and my happy place, at the same time I've realized over the past few years that there's nothing more important than making connections in real life and that real connections are not made behind the computer screen. 
So I, had, I attended a lot of conferences, and I realized it's my creative community getting together, but it's only once a year. And conferences are oftentimes, in, in some sense, elitist, and they're, they're expensive, and they're not accessible for everyone, and they're incredibly time-consuming. So I figured there had to be something else that was more accessible. And I had the idea for Creative Mornings. Uh, once a month, a lecture and a morning, like you come, you have breakfast, you listen to someone talk for 20 minutes, you have a little more coffee, and then off you go to work, inspired, hopefully, uh, and off you go and go after your day. So I started it in my studio almost five years ago, and it was welcomed with such enthusiasm that soon we had to go into bigger spaces. For example, here, this is Ko Yuen speaking uh, at the meet at the apartment, a beautiful space in Soho. But now we're at the point where we fill a space with 500 people within like two minutes. This is an uh, advertising legend, George Lewis, speaking at the Met Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, in October. And what I find fascinating is that a big institution like the Metropolitan Museum actually approached us and sees the value of having this creative community come in in the morning and meeting in, in their space. We also had it in, for example, a, an indoor park. And what I never, ever expected is that creative mornings would grow beyond just uh, New York. I had a friend in Zurich that asked me if he could start a chapter. And because I'm from Switzerland, I kind of felt, that's on brand. OK, we can do that. And he did an amazing job. And then my friend, John Zetson, who sits right here, who's been to many, many creative mornings in Brooklyn, moved to LA. And he's like, come on, Tina, I can take this to LA. And because I trust him, I was like, OK. And then the next thing you know, there's San Francisco, and now we are at 49 chapters around the world. And I am so humbled every time I look at this map, where more and more dots pop up. And we, every day, we get uh, applications from around the world for people who wanna, want to volunteer and cr uh, host a Creative Mornings in their city. And by the way, we just approved Austin. Ben Toma will be the host, and Austin Cleon will be the first speaker next month. So whenever I start looking through photos that come, keep coming in from these events from around the world, I'm incredibly humbled. Because it's just something small. I felt the need and started in New York. But now, with all these hosts around the world, I see these photos of, of creative people around the world, all around the world meeting up. And it's inc incredibly touching. And most of all, now that we have monthly themes, there's 49 hosts. Uh, picking 49 speakers around a topic, around creativity. For example, this month is reuse. Last month was money. And now we have like 49 talks based on a topic, like all surrounded around a topic coming out. And it's so incredibly powerful. And it's all volunteer based. It's like all volunteers that make it happen. It sponsors paying for breakfast. And it's just so incredibly humbling. Who here was a Kickstarter supporter of our Kickstarter last year? Yay, thank you. So we had a Kickstarter uh, last year where we raised money so we can build a good site that we can sh share all of this content. And I'm going to give you a sneak peek. Um, Oak Studio, the Oak Studio guys, Sawyer, has been working like crazy on the new design of the site. And nobody has seen this, guys, OK? So this is a sneak peek of where we are right now. The home page, um, a video page, the sample video page, what it would look like, and the CDs page. I mean, I. I am convinced that once we launch this new site, it's going to make waves in the creative communi community because everybody's going to realize how incredibly big and powerful Creative Mornings has gotten. So that was the one way. Thank you. So Creative Morning was my one way of getting like-minded people together, but that was only once a month, and that was just not, not enough for me. Um, at the time, I was working from home, and I just realized, I mean, there's only so many things you can say to a fridge. And, <clears throat> and I was really lonely. And I realized I had this vision of a really, really supportive, creative um, space where, where I can have other creative people around me, and we can support each other. And I looked for a space, and I found one in Dumbo. And this is the original studio-made space where I built it out, and I figured, you know, rent desks. And it's really true. You build it, and they will come. And we are now, we've been breaking down walls left and right, and we are now a group. I was four in the beginning. We're now 40. We're developers, illustrators, photographers, designers, 
uh, you name it, all across the board. Extremely complementing skills. Everyone is extremely entrepreneurial, has very high standards, and it's it's, I call it my happy place. It's not your usual co-working space, I would say, because it's extremely um, communal, and uh, we're a really friendly bunch. And for example, this is uh, the guy smirking on the right. That's Cameron, it was his birthday, and Cameron tends to wear plaid, jeans, field notes, and flip-flops. So we all secretly said we're gonna dress up in his like uniform, and when he came in on his birthday, it took him a few minutes until he realized what was going on. So when you go to studiomates.com, I'm pretty sure you will recognize quite a few of the names on, on, uh, in the space. And I know for a fact I would not be here today if it wasn't for the influence of my studio mates. They have all set my standards so much higher because of the amazing work they all put out and the support they give me. And Seth Godin has a beautiful quote that goes, who you hang out with determines what you dream about and what you collide with. And the collisions and the dreams lead to your changes, and the changes are what you become. Change the outcome by changing your circle. And Studio Mates has changed my outcome. What I didn't realize is that there would be a tremendous amount of collaboration coming out of Studio Mates. But now looking back, of course, if you put really talented people with complementing skills in one room, of course you will end up collaborating. And my first and my next rule, number seven, is step away from ego and collaborate whenever you can. And my first example for this is when um, I sat down over a lunch conversation in 2009 with Cameron, my studio mate of Fictive Kin. And I just happened to see that he was putting something into Things, his to-do app that he was using at the time. And I said, do you like things? And we started this big conversation around to-do apps, and I've tried them all, and I'm really passionate about workflow and all that. And so I started sketching out in this big, epic discussion around to-dos, uh, to-do apps um, uh, over lunch at Studio Mates. I started sketching out what I want. I always knew I want to have a calendar-based to-do app, and I want to have the satisfaction of crossing things off. And as I was sketching, Cameron just laughed. I mean, I'm a user interface designer, but it never occurred to me that I could actually make it, right? It's silly. So he laughed and said, Tina, for goodness sakes, just design it, and me and Evan will build it for you. So I sat down, I designed it, I handed it off to Cameron, and sure enough, 48 hours later, we had the working prototype for to-do. We started using it in our studio, and whenever somebody else wanted a, uh, wanted a login, we just had to hand code it in. And after a few months of doing that, and pretty much everyone at Studio Mates using it, uh, I said to Cameron, come on, let's just make a small marketing website, and let's give this away for free. Let's, you know, it's helpful to us. Let's, you know, other people might, have, might, be, uh, might take use of it as well. So we made a small site and launched in December of 2009. Uh, Cameron made a really funny video, and the FAQ is even better. Um, so you can kind of tell we didn't take it all that seriously. So we launched, and I wrote about it on my blog. And this is the very first time I got to experience what people call the Swiss Miss effect, because I wrote about it. And about an hour later, Cameron looks at me and goes, oh boy, oh boy, I'm not sure our service can handle this. We had sign-ups for the thousands, Aaron Fireball and Seth Godin, and everybody blogged about it. Um, the, the internet kind of imploded on us. And what was really peculiar is Fast Company, an hour later, wrote a really, really flattering blog post about us, a long one saying it's the best to do up of 2009. And I was like, we just made it. We launched in December, and we won. So who here uses Todo? Yay, I have good news for you. Because there's something no coming. Um, <laughs> we got a new studio mate about a year ago. His name is Johnny Hallman. He's an incredibly young, talented designer and developer. And he's been using Todo from the very beginning. He was extremely passionate about it. And he basically said to me and Cameron, come on, let's make this better. He's been working nonstop for the past few months and has completely rebuilt the app. And I'm going to give you a sneak peek. We're probably going to launch next week. So he's, it's super fast now. It's, um, you can resize it, and it goes down to one column. It works on all the different platforms on the browsers. Uh, we, you can use Markdown now, where you can make things bold and italics. There's um, 
recurring to do's now. You can have as many columns on the bottom with headers now as you want, so you can categorize them by project or by personal. Um, in short, if you use to do and if you like the simplicity of it, we've just made it so much better. And we're so excited to relaunch it this week. But we also had to make the decision to move away from the free model because we've realized there are so many people who are passionate about to do. Like our inboxes and our Twitter uh, stream is full of like sentences of to do changes my life. But we've realized we did not have the capacity or the money to justify to work on it and uh, update it unless we start charging. So for all of you that use it, please know that we start charging for to do with the best of our intentions because we want to we want to do to stick around. We don't want to do to be one of these apps that we get. Hung, hung, that we start loving and then they go, they go away because either the talent was eaten up by someone else or they run out of money. We are starting to charge out of, out of the best intentions to keep to their around and we hope you're excited about the new changes. If you want to know uh, when we're launching, go to knowtodo.com and you can sign up. So today was the first real collaboration that I can think of that came out of Studio Mates. But check this out. I just made a quick list of what else came out of Studio Mates. There's a book apart, there's quarterly, there's drop mark, farm stand, stash, Brooklyn Beta and Summer Camp, Symbol Set, Tiny Bob, Gimme Bar, Done Not Done, and Editorially. And Mandy, the co-founder of Editorial, actually told me that it wouldn't have occurred to me to start a company like this if not for the time spent with my studio mates. And, and what is beautiful is that I, Editorially is not open yet to the public, but she let me use it, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful um, collaboration writing tool. And I actually used it for writing my speech, and she edited it. And we used the tool that she built because she came into my space, and it was like going full circle and makes me all kinds of happy. And also, for example, the Collaborative Fund, they said they would have never invested into Quarterly, which was built by Oak, if it wasn't for the trust they had in the surroundings of studio mates. And this brings me to a beautiful quote from Clay Shirky. We systematically overestimate the value of access to information and underestimate the value of access to each other. Unfortunately, we're all also sometimes called an elitist club, which kind of hurts me a little bit, but brings me to rule number eight, ignore haters. It's taken me a little while to get confident in this. <laughs> but haters get absolute none of my time. I know what it takes to build something, and if somebody just comes in and hates on it without any, no, like, the slightest constructive criticism in, in there, I have, I have no respect for it. We always have to remember when we criticize something that there's a person on the other side. And I will teach my children all I can to stay away of, of people that are fond of disliking things. And Sharon Lee said it so beautifully. There are people who build things, and there are people who tear things down. And you just got to have to remember which side you're on. And I'm just really hoping that our community stays constructive and supportive, because I unfortunately have seen a lot of hating creeping in recently, and I hope we as a community can, can um, destroy that, that trend. But I learned... <laughs> but I learned one thing. You can monetize the hate. Now, whenever someone hates on me, I link, I link to the Tatley, uh, haters gonna hate. I figured I can at least make money off someone. <clears throat> this brings me to rule number nine. And I have to fully admit, I am actually not a full master of this yet. Make time to think and breathe. While I realize I really need to make time to relax, I'm like most of the time like this wobble thing that you see right now on the screen. I always go full speed, and I never really stop. But I'm making many, many steps to get better in this. And um, one of my very best decisions last year was to hire uh, a personal assistant, and it was thanks to advice that Te 
Ted Perlman gave me, who always shows up every now and then and helps me figure out uh, challenges that I'm facing. Um, so Ted Perlman asked me to write down for a week every, every single task I do. And he asked me to rate it and how much time I spend on it. So I ended up with about five or six pages of, of things I do every day or through, through the course of a week. And while I'm really pragmatic and, and practical, this has never occurred to me to actually rate the things I do. So it was a smiley face or like, nah, I don't care, or like a sad face. But what I've realized instantly once I looked at this list is like the things that I really am like not enjoying and that make my day really hectic are things that I could easily outsource or, or um, have an assistant do. So it just so had it that our Johnny Hallman, our studio mate, his wife was looking for a job. So I hired her and she's just amazing. She's made my life, Jen has made my life so much better. She takes this hectic element out of my days. She's like a studio manager as well of, of, of studio mates and has poured so much love into it. And on top of it, she's a really fantastic illustrator. So we have like an in-house illustrator on top of it now. So my life has improved tenfold and I've realized it's the first step towards like taking better care of myself by having someone help me take the load off. But at the same time, I understand, um, oh uh, no, there's actually a quote I wanted to say first. It's wonderful things can happen when your brain is empty and um, Jen has definitely helped me make more brain space for that. So, but I also realized that I need to really get better with working out. I'm sure I'm probably not the only one in here. I hope not. Um, so I have this really irrational fear of yoga and there's a yoga studio down the hall and I need, I mean, I have no excuses. I walk by it every day. So I promise myself that when this talk is over and I come home from South by Southwest, I'm going to overcome my fear and call this number that I have on a post-it note on my computer and call this personal yoga trainer. I figured if I take one or two personal lessons, I can get over this irrational fear and then maybe I can take a, a group class. And this brings me to my rule number 10. If an opportunity scares you, you need to take it. In 2004, when I was working as a design director at ThinkMap, uh, I got my very, very first invitation to speak at a conference. It was uh, AIGA Seattle. And I remember reading the email, and when I sa saw that <laughs> Jill Maeda is the keynote speaker, I just laughed and said, no way. Uh, the thought of me speaking in front of a large audience in English, which is obviously not my uh, native language, it was like, no way. So I. I let it sit in my inbox, and two days later, I just realized that I had to do this. So I, I agreed, I prepared, like I've never prepared for anything in my life before, I think. And I traveled with my husband to Seattle, and there I am, this is very meta, it's me on stage and me on stage. And I gave my very first um, talk at a conference. And after it was over, I remember this rush, and I walked to back towards where my husband was sitting, and because he knew how much I prepared, and he knew how much I looked up to John Maeda, and how much I cared about doing a good job. And I walk up to him, and I'm walking into the row where he was, and he was like doing this awkward movement, going turn around, turn around, and I was, and I turn around, and there's John Maeda chasing me, and he stands in front of me, and in his typical John Maeda way, he goes. That was really inspiring. Thank you so much. And he walked off. And then I turned over to my husband, and then he had a smile from here to here because he knew what, it, what that meant to me. And every time I'm scared of something now, I, I, rem I remember this John Maeda moment of like overcoming my fear. And Bill Crosby puts it so beautifully. Decide that you want it more than you're afraid of it because it always pays off in the end. And now my last room, my, my last rule. I think we all, our lives would be so much better if we all had an eccentric ant in our lives, like I did. And in some sense, we just have to be that eccentric ant to someone else. And what I'm hoping is with all the things I do, with my blog, with Creative Mornings, with Tatley, with Studio Mates, that I can, in some sense, give a passionate sense of potential to the people around me and in my life, and that I can inspire them just a fraction of my, what my end inspired me. I want to close with one quote. Whatever you are, be a good one. Thank you so much. All right, thank you again for coming. We're now going to move to our audience Q&A. Just a reminder, you can tweet in your questions for Ms. Eisenberg at hashtag AskEisenberg. 
So our first question for Ms. Eisenberg is if you could collaborate on a project with any person of your choice, who would it be? If I could collaborate with any person of any choice, who would it be? Al Gore? <laughs> you got to reach high, right? Why? Oh, he inspires me. He's passionate. He believes in what he does. He's a very good speaker. I'm, in, I'm impressed by what he does. Okay. The next question comes from Irina Kepich, and her question is, how difficult was it to integrate your Swiss identity while building a career in a completely different country? Well, I think moving abroad and uh, living in a different culture is actually a complete advantage because you have a viewpoint of how it can work in a different culture and then you look at what, where you are uh, in a different way and you kind of combine the best of both. I've always tried to sort of make it to my advantage uh, that I'm Swiss. And for example, you know, the, the, my first boss that hired me, he literally said, you're Swiss? Oh my God, you show up early, you're totally reliable, you're hired. So just work with the best you have from your culture. Okay. Our next question is from Raji Purcell, and his question is, with the advent of online learning and conferences, is design school still relevant to gaining a meaningful design career? Um, well, I know a lot of people who have kind of are self-taught. I still believe there is a there is a space for, for uh, an art school. And what I always looked art school at is like that I bought myself a certain amount of time that I could experiment in and learn as much as I could. So uh, yes, I still believe art school has its space. Nora Ahern asks, if you could make a Swiss Miss Army knife, what would it have in it? Um, a USB adapter, Wi-Fi. <laughs> Uh, those two things are crucial. I don't know. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki Jeske asks, what do you do or where do you go when you get a creative block? Any advice to get out of a rut? Um, I think what anyone else does, just walk down the street or I turn around and I chat with my studio mates or we play Uno in our studio and just get our minds off what we were thinking about. Okay. Alex Weiser asks, What's your advice for folks who'd like to start a curated blog like Swiss Miss? Just know what you're passionate about and, and collect it as if you do it for yourself and do it every day and, and just be enthusiastic and just keep doing it. Okay. Rosie asks, for non-designers out there, what's the best thing we can do to increase our design prowess? Our what? Our design prowess. What, what is that? Sorry, I don't know that <laughs> word. <laughs> Sorry. You're <laughs> testing my English major ability. <laughs> it is uh, your design prowess would be your ability to design or your okay. capabilities and power with design. Okay, we skipped. Next one. All right, okay. we'll go to the next one. <laughs> 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 Any tips on being a working mom and balancing your work life? Have an amazing husband like I do that helps. <laughs> no, I mean, really, I couldn't do it if my husband wouldn't be as helpful as he is and we share our duties. Matthew Sanders asks, can you give another example of an opportunity that scared you, that you missed? Being right here, right now. <laughs> what about an opportunity that you missed? Oh. Oh. That's hard. I'm sorry, I'm blanking. I'm sure there's many. I, I just can't think of one. I'm sorry. Hans asks, what's Hans, the... Hans, for short, and I know this guy. <laughs> <laughs> he always brings me uh, Kinder eggs from Belgium because they're not allowed anymore in America. Anyway, yes. He's like... <laughs> well, he wants to know what's the next step. Just keep, it, keep doing it and make everything better and bigger and, and just grow creative mornings and, and continue, continue being happy. What about business-wise? Well, that's what I mean. Oh, okay. Business and, and play is all the same. <laughs> Tom Bassett asked, what were some of the 11 rules that almost made the list? Um, I should have, I think, included how important it is to, to pick the right partner that's helpful. I think that would be, I need to add that next time, rule number 12. Um, like I, need, I think my husband deserves a, a, its own segment on like if you have the right partner that helps you, only then can you really do it as like kid and business thing all at once. Okay. Brad asks, who is on the <laughs> nice, secret Tadley Excel spreadsheet? I cannot tell you. 
<laughs> but I wish I could. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I can't. Okay, so I will. Uh, I'll actually ask you something. I'm curious about what role do you think uh, ethics and morality plays in both starting a business and growing a business and just maintaining your business presence? Well, I could give a whole other hour talk on that one. Um, I feel extremely passionate in being respectful with the people we work with that surround us, um, with having really high standards and, and have ethics and, and following them and not just, you know, cutting, like just being, like all of a sudden you have this incredible opportunity to make a lot of money but because it kind of goes against your ethics stick to them. I really wish more people would. And just today I had, an, had a, an encounter where I was asked for some of my time and the person didn't prepare and didn't, it was just really, really disrespectful. And these are things that I just wish wouldn't happen. If, like if you ask for someone for, for a favor, make sure that you're prepared and, and vice versa. Just let's all just be really respectful for each other and for each other's time. Evan Leach asks, your team is full of strong women. What can the entrepreneurial community do to encourage more women to take the leap? Uh, hire them? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Brad wants to know if you were stuck on an island with three fonts, what would they be? <laughs> oh my god. OK, it's not Helvetica. It's not Helvetica. Uh, Trey Gothic condensed alternate Gothic number two. Uh, what's the third? Oh, Atrament that we use for creative mornings. Yes, there we go. Um, I'll ask another question. Uh, you've been here for a while, but what has surprised you most about either the American culture or New York City culture specifically? with regards to your business growth? With regards to my business growth? Yes. What I am still continuously blown away with, and I don't know if this just is a New York thing, but I remember when I first came to New York and I met people, they would, without a blink, they would introduce me to someone they know if they thought that that person could be helpful to my career. And the way that New Yorkers help each other and just moving forward and making connections is something that I did not know from Switzerland. In Switzerland, you're, um, it might be different by now because I've been gone for 13 years, but from when I remember it is, you would not recommend someone to someone else if you, know, if you don't know that they would not embarrass you. Does that make sense? So I, I just feel like this helpfulness of, of what that New Yorker, they have this instinct to connect you with that other person that might be helpful to you, and they gain nothing. That is something that I truly admire. Okay, Gary asks, it seems you have many ideas. How do you decide on which ones to pursue and finish? The ones I'm more pa the most passionate about and that I don't run out on enthusiasm. <laughs> All right, I got another one. Okay. Uh, you talked about, you put up a lot of quotes and you talked about a lot of people that have inspired you, but who inspires you most, at least in your personal life? Where do you draw that inspiration from? Oh my God, they just asked me this for, um, Michael Johnson just asked me this question, I think it was him, and there's just so many people that inspire me for different reasons. And for example, one person that comes to mind is Jim Kudal, who so inspires me, like he was kind of the first one that put this in my head that you could not have clients anymore, because he did so many side projects that allowed him to not have clients anymore. Or, um, Oh my God, there's so many people that inspire me for different reasons. There's Milton, Glaser, who, there's Milton Glaser, who is so passionate about what he does, still in his 80s, and, and works every day. There's Paula Scher, who is like, who's an amazing designer, and, and is still does such amazing work, and, and is so approachable. And I mean, there's, there's so many people. I, I, I don't have just one person. I could go on and on. Yeah. All right, Anthony asks, what do you think about democratizing design? If you created a design school, what would it look like? Um, one thing I know is if I started a design school, I would make sure that all the teachers that teach there are still hands-on and working in the field. Because I remember from when I was back in design school, the, te the teachers that taught me the most were the ones that were really actively still doing it. All right, well, thank you for coming. Thank you.